for years now, guys, I've been saying things about solar that people say are unrealistic, that I'm delusional, that really the future of the global energy industry worldwide they claim is either nuclear or nuclear and, I don't know, some future imaginary technology. But actually, the future is it's already here. And in fact, the stats back this up. Tony Sieber has been saying for a long time now that we don't need, we don't need any fossil fuels whatsoever. Wind, solar and batteries are the solution. But of those three, I've been saying for a while that I think solar is the most important. Renew Economy says it's the S-curve stupid and their new model predicts that half of the world's energy will come from solar by 2035. A lot of people think, well, hang on a minute, what about these, you know, developing countries or you could say third world countries, places like um, African countries, or, you know, Pakistan. Hang on a minute, Pakistan has a huge amount of solar, huge. I mean, I think it's the second largest energy source in the country now. Anyhow, hello, my friends. Welcome to the channel. Great to have you with us. I'm Sam Evans. You're watching The Electric Viking. In the first weeks of 2025, with, um, I don't know, fires burning all over the place. There's a, an enormous battery fire, an NMC LG Chem battery in California, burned down the third biggest battery in the world. Uh, fires are all raging across Los Angeles. Trump is back in the White House. Uh, there's some crazy stuff going on here. The government here in Australia might change to a government that want to get rid of renewables and they think that nuclear is the answer. They're delusional. They're crazy. And they're ignoring the fact that Solar energy prices have come down by more than 90% over the past 10 years. And at the same time, efficiency has improved. And a lot of people say, well, hang on a minute, solar panels, you can't recycle those. Well, here's the thing. The newest solar panels are guaranteed to last for 25 years. Most companies, the biggest companies in the world are guaranteeing them for 25 years. But in the real world, they're going to last for significantly longer than that. And we have the data, at least we have the data on older versions that weren't as good. According to estimates from the Global Solar Council and Solar Power Europe, the world reached the stunning cumulative total of two terawatts of installed solar capacity in November last year. That's a milestone that came just two years after the first terawatt mark, which took 68 years. So it took the world 68 years to hit one terawatt. Then it took two years to hit two terawatts. So we doubled the amount of solar capacity on the entire planet in two years. Can you imagine? how much more quickly this would happen, how much more quickly this solar revolution would happen if governments all around the world weren't actually out for their own, you know, their own political reasons. If they weren't pandering to whoever they think they need to pander to. They're just telling the truth. This is the truth. Solar is the solution. Solar and batteries are the primary solution. In Australia, Rooftop Solar regularly supplies the majority of daytime power in South Australia's grid and in other state networks, it's gearing up to do the same. We have a huge percentage of homeowners here in Australia who have solar panels. In New South Wales, utility-scale solar generated more than 40% of our state's power for the first time in the first week of January. That's a remarkable milestone for one of Australia's biggest remaining coal power locations. The biggest coal power plant, though, here in Australia is being destroyed in order to build the second biggest battery in the world on that location. According to a newly launched climate modeling tool, the answer to the questions around solar, can it be the main source of energy worldwide? Well, the answer is yes. The S-curve model developed by Australian solar industry pioneer Andrew Birch says that by 2035, half of the world's energy needs will be supplied by solar in a classic S-curve technology shift. I know many of you have been watching this happen and you're just thinking, sitting here watching, thinking to yourself, yeah, I know this, but it's good when the, me the, the news media start to point it out as well, and they are in this case. The S-curve projects forward solar's historical trends, predicting that it will continue to fall in cost by 10% per year and grow at a rate of 25% per year. This will see solar energy eclipse nuclear power this year and eclipse oil by 2031. On current growth trends, solar is on track to displace 50% of traditional energy, su energy supply within a decade, says Birch, a University of New South Wales PV engineering graduate and founding member of some of the leading global solar companies over the last 20 years. 
This should scare you if you're still financing coal, oil, or gas, he adds. If you're invested in a company that is invested in coal, oil, or gas, or internal combustion cars, I suggest getting out of it. I mean, it's insane. If you're shorting it, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Birch's theory is that three huge mistakes, including a flawed equation at the heart of solar projections, have resulted in decades of inaccurate energy market forecasting on solar. The first mistake he says in a new video on his website is the belief that solar cost reductions are suddenly going to stop from nowhere. The second mistaken assumption is that the market's consistent growth of well over 25% a year will also suddenly end. As I've been saying this on the channel constantly, I must have said this 50 times at least, solar continues to come down in price and cost every year. At the same time, energy efficiency of those same panels continues to grow every year. And those panels continue to get better in terms of their longevity, their ability to last for longer. I've seen the analysts call the end to this growth every single year, he says, and they've been proven wrong again and again and again. The final mistake Birch describes as more of an accounting problem. We're told by traditional energy brains that we need a certain amount of energy to run our economy, but over half of that fossil fuel energy is wasted when we burn it in our homes, cars, and power plants, he says. In other words, it's not efficient. It's extremely inefficient, that energy we're burning. The S-curve seeks to correct this by using delivered energy as the metric underpinning projections rather than primary energy. In this way, the projections show a solar electric economy will require 60% less energy than was previously assumed. Solar's learning curve has never ended, says Birch. In fact, its growth rate has increased. When you combine that growth trend with the lower energy needed with electrification, you get a solar-dominated system within just 10 years. Now, all these projections don't include battery storage. Keep in mind, we are wasting billions of dollars, billions and billions and billions of dollars of renewable energy, whether that's wind or solar power, because we don't yet have the batteries to store that energy. But next year, based on the contracts that have been signed, battery storage growth worldwide will hit a factor of 7,200%. Now, that's real. That's a fact. That means that whilst we may think we are falling behind in terms of the energy production we need because of renewables, it's actually the opposite. Next year, or at least over the next 18 months, we're going to have probably far more energy hit our grids from renewables than we would have expected because of this huge surge in battery deployment. Birchie, as he calls himself, has a long and distinguished solar pedigree. Having abandoned his first career choice, investment banking, to pursue a master's degree in photovoltaic engineering at the University of New South Wales. RenewEconomy.com.au says that he then joined BP Solar, where he developed the world first PB financing, financing solutions and designed the feed in tariff model that kickstarted the Australian solar market. Following the advent of Google Earth, Birch co founded Sungevity alongside Danny Kennedy, Alex Gutel, and Adam Pryor, which pioneered the first software to provide instant online rooftop solar quotes with sizing and measuring done remotely. A decade or so later, Birch and Pryor started Open Solar, the world's first free sole software retailing and installation platform that has more than 25,000 users in more than 150 countries. Currently, Birch is based in the UK, where he has been collaborating with Professor Andrew Crossland at the Durham University Energy Institute on the best ways to support the growth of solar all around the world and to use solar, electri solar electrification to benefit consumers. They have co-authored a white paper for Ed Miliband, the UK's Secretary of State for Energy Security and Net Zero. According to Birch, to solve the climate crisis, installed solar capacity needs to grow at a rate of 25% per annum. He says the solar S-curve can solve most of the climate challenge in a decade as long as, as it is backed by the right policies. We've been told a clean transition will cripple the economy. I mean, a lot of um, politicians are saying this because it's in their agenda, when in fact, it will save us $9 trillion a year by 2035. Oxford University, by the way, uh, they have a 
approximately 50 engineers and scientists that worked on a, a paper that actually laid out a framework for why renewable energy will save us around $10 trillion a year, which is similar to what Birchie is saying here. All we need is a level playing field. Just watch how quickly dirty fuels die in a fair fight when we can stop subsidies and remove clean tech tariffs. The right policies, according to Birch, including, include letting solar storage and EV compete on price. Just on price, nothing else. Don't add tariffs on clean technology. The jobs are all local, not in manufacturing, the website says. Remo remove all energy subsidies because nobody actually needs it. We're better off without them. The second policy priority on the wish list is a little less contentious. The digitization and automation of, of permitting and interconnection to ensure speedy connection to the grid. Now, I personally have had issues getting my system connected to the grid, so I can see what he, where he's coming from here. Finally, Birch is calling for an electric protocol, a standard set of rules for the worldwide grid with uniform market price treatment for all energy sources of any size connecting to the grid. These allow all customers and, and prosumers to access the time of day value of energy and the value of other services they provide to the grid, meaning batteries can peak shave, regulate frequency, avoid infrastructure spend on the grid, battery owners should be compensated so consumers get the lowest cost grid. Now, honestly, this makes sense. A lot of people are saying, hey, a minute, why don't governments just subsidize people to have solar and batteries on their houses? This will lead to the lowest cost grid. We don't need all these massive grid work, right? When you're trying to connect these big solar farms, these big nuclear power plants, you need to put in huge transmission cables. But if you simply enable households to become net energy producers, well, the grid for those households already exists. The key message Birch hopes to convey through his modeling is that the solar-driven shift to renewables is inevitable, not because the world is on a mission to halt or stop dangerous climate change. And it, I mean, we should be. But this would be nice, but because of the pure economics of solar, something I've been saying for years as well, it just makes economic sense. The s he says, challenges a widely held consensus that fossil fuels will continue to dominate and it will cost us trillions of dollars to decarbonize our economy. The energy transition won't cost us money, like we're always told. The S-curve is powered by the fact that solar is now the best and the lowest cost solution for you, the end consumer. Do you agree? Let me know what your thoughts are in the comment section below. 